much that once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. I had never heard of Stephen Baxter until The Long Earth came out, which he co-wrote with Sir Terry Pratchett. And The Long Earth I didn't know about until Destruction Snake Pit mentioned it in a comment of my review of Snuff. Given that I really enjoy The Long Earth, I resolved to check out some of Baxter's other work, and to that end, I randomly picked something from the By the Same Author section. Ten thousand years ago, during the Mesolithic period, the ice caps are melting. This is bad news for the people of Northland, a large patch of land that links what will become the British Isles to mainland Europe, as history has them drowned out of existence. Only, this time, things are going to be different. The people of Etzela are going to push back against the coming tide and change the course of history. Third person past tense, with major changes in time or location being prefaced by snippets of information of what, geologically speaking, was happening at the time. I found the prose as a whole interesting to get to grips with. For the main it's well written, but it does have one fairly regular and kind of interesting little tick about it, which is that some sentences don't quite feel finished. For example, a single thread of drool dripped from her open mouth, the stubs of her worn teeth. It just seems to me like there should be a few more words to tie things together. I've never really explored the whole alternate history genre, well, unless of course you count the Red Alert series. I'm not entirely sure why that is, to be honest. Maybe because the ones I tend to stumble across in bookshops all seem to be about America beating the shit out of evil nasty Britain. So, I wasn't really sure what to expect when I sat down to read this, because here we're not just dealing with alternate history, but with alternate prehistory, and it's all set in a place that doesn't actually exist anymore. And I have to say, for the most part, I was pleasantly surprised. The first 200 pages of the novel start telling an interesting enough story about life, love and survival on Mesolithic Earth. There are perhaps a few hints about how the world is beginning to change, but otherwise there's no indication whatsoever as to what is about to hit the people of Northland. There are two main cultures that we see described in any great detail here, the people of Etzela in Northland and the Britanni in Albion. There are three main protagonists coming from both those particular groups. Anna is a woman of Etzela who we first meet at 14. She's a thoughtful person, but has few real concerns beyond surviving long enough to raise some children. Her sister, Zezi, is by far the stronger of the two, and is much more of a natural leader. From the Britanni, we have Shade, an atypical example of his people, in that he actually tries to use his brain on occasion. He is also, without wishing to spoil too much, quite probably the most undeservedly unlucky bastard in all of ancient Britain. And it's the relationship between these three characters, I mean more so than any other characters, that forms the core of the story. Beyond certain geological events that can't be changed, everything that happens revolves around those three. When the tsunami hits Etzela, and that's not a spoiler because that's the big geological event that this entire novel is based around, it drastically alters not just the land, but how the story set up in the first 200 pages develops. Although it might have been interesting to see how things would have played out under more normal circumstances, the way the characters change, the way the drama warps, it was all very well handled. For me, that's probably the best feature of this novel. When things begin to change, both for the characters and ultimately for the world, the focus remains firmly on those characters, and it doesn't expand into some sweeping, unfocused tale about global upheaval. I think it really is a testament to just how well written I found these characters, that on several occasions I found myself saying out loud, Oh, no, 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 please don't do it. Or I was getting angry at what they were doing, so angry in fact that I felt the urge to reach back in time 10,000 years and bitch slap them for being utter bastards. One thing I did like about the structure of the story itself is its time scale and how it was handled. Although the first half of the novel is set over about a year, the whole tale is set over around 30. As a consequence, we get a couple of multi-year time jumps which lets us see how all the characters have changed over many years. We see characters grow up, and we see characters grow old, and I was genuinely glad to see that. This might sound a little soppy on my part, but 
It did make me smile to see how two characters turned out that we first met as a child and a baby. This additionally made one moment at the very end of the novel uh, a little more poignant for me than it probably should have, but then again I have no problem in admitting that I'm a soppy bugger. Now, I realise that I've just spent a great deal of time extolling the virtues of this novel, but I did use the words for the most part near the start, and that's because there are a couple of things that kind of bug me. To start with, that moment of poignancy that I just mentioned, well, the moment in question was all but a throwaway line. This annoyed me, because it concerned a character we had known since childhood, and, I don't know, I would have liked a little more closure on that. Secondly, there are a few parts of this novel that read like this novel was meant to be a multi-book story. They reiterate and explain the events of the novel, and do so badly. One instance near the end particularly annoyed me. One of the characters mentions what was the culmination of all the drama that I had literally just read. Also, there were a few moments during the ending of the drama that felt a little rushed, I think. Characters who had been so focused on certain goals for so long seemed to just change their minds and reform a little too quickly for my liking. Yes, it ultimately all was for the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! But given the amount of time spent on the setup, which totaled about 330 pages of a 500 page novel, I think I would have liked a bit more, I don't know, a bit more of the argument and debate that ultimately swayed them and got them to change their opinion. And on that sort of note, the ending of the novel left me with an interesting feeling. I want to see what happens next to these characters. If I'm honest, the prospect of a chime jump of a couple of thousand years or whatever it is to the start of the sequel doesn't feel like what I really want next in this particular alternate universe. Now, I, I realise the whole point of these is ultimately to speculate how different the world would be if such and such happened, but maybe again it's just a testament to how much I enjoyed reading about these characters and their plight that the thought of the next novel in this series featuring a society that is like as not forgotten who Anna was, who her people were, that what they went through to achieve what they did. I don't know, it, it just doesn't quite sit well with me. It feels it feels a little sad and a little tragic that their struggle is destined to be forgotten by their descendants. But then I, I guess that's part of the course with the march of history. So, yeah, I mean, despite a few niggles, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. The cultures presented are interesting and distinct. The characters, for me, were very well written. And the ending, whilst not entirely satisfying, certainly does have a sense of history about it. And whatever I might ultimately end up thinking of Bronze Summer and Iron Winter, I am definitely going to be reading more novels by Stephen Baxter.